delighted to see so many online today. Uh, and I am very much looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have. It's time to move on to our speakers. Ben, would you like uh, to get us started? Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Federica, and, uh, and thanks to Norsher for the, for the fantastic seminar series that they're, they're putting together in these extraordinary times. Um, I guess my, my thought in posing this as a topic was, um, and I'll limit myself to sort of six, seven minutes um, on this because the Q&A and this conversation will be much more interesting than possibly my, certainly my, certainly my presentation. Um, I mean, was to think about the implications of, of the current crisis and looking at the union as a global actor. And what has struck me most particularly, I think, is what this crisis reminds us about the European Union rather than so much telling us anything new about the European Union. But I've got a couple of points at the end that might point to some, some new things. I think what the crisis reminds us is the union is not a Westphalian state, not a Westphalian actor. It lacks the decisive political hierarchy. It's a partial polity with significant gaps in policy coverage. And critically, um, it, it lacks control over its own borders. I mean, we, we saw each of the member states react in a very ad hoc and immediate way to the, to the crisis and the emergency. Um, and it just underscored the fact that the union does not even have the basic attributes uh, of a global actor in terms of defending its own borders. The other thing I think which was striking to me from the, from the crisis was the extent to which, of course, the union does not encompass a demos, does not encompass a people. Um, and the way in which in, in a time of immediate crisis and fear, that people reverted immediately and instantly to mm -hmm. national government and local government for defense, for security, for reassurance, and for action. Um, and again, underscores this idea that the union is not well placed, is not well situated to respond in a, in a time of crisis and a time of emergency. Uh, the union's attribute, its strengths in terms of consensus building, in terms of a more deliber deliberative approach uh, to decision making, um, was seen in many quarters, and I can understand why, but was seen in many quarters as being one of lethargy, one of lateness, one of slowness, one of inability. Um, and that is, if you like, the, the, the flip side of the coin of the strengths of consensus building and deliberation. It is necessarily slow, it is necessarily time consuming. Um, so we relied very much on the, on the nation states to provide instant, instant reactions and instant responses. Um, but in terms of the new things uh, that occur to be coming out, of the, coming out of the crisis, one of those was that the union's own emergency response, the union's own emergency response, own emergency response mechanisms were found, were found not to work. Uh, the, the infamous case of the Italian request for emergency response and the deafening silence from the individual member states really said that even though we ostensibly had the infrastructure for an emergency response, we didn't actually have the substance there uh, with which to, to, to fulfill that response. Um, I think we've also learned, perhaps not so much new, but nonetheless significant, the union is a very bad communicator, uh, a very bad communicator both within itself and to its own member states and populations, but also a very bad communicator externally uh, in contesting uh, the emergence of narratives uh, from other external actors. And you see this particularly in the contestation we've seen with respect to, to, to the Chinese narrative that was being sold, the, the Russian narrative to, to a lesser extent. Um, we've also seen, and again, it, 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 it's something slightly new, that the extent to which the union can be weakened both by internal dissension, internal contestants, as well as external contestants. Um, we're looking now in terms of the response to, to China and Hong Kong, the way in which certain member states um, are, are driving an agenda which, which prevents the union responding in a more decisive way to those particularly tragic events uh, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, but if I end, if I try to end on a, on a more positive note, um, what I would say is this is, this reminds me also of the, of the Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare, uh, the rabbit and the turtle, in which you know, the quick, the quick one off the mark, the quick one who runs fastest, gathers the greatest uh, <coughs> is not necessarily the actor that wins the race in the end. Um, mm -hmm. And we are seeing now in the sort of the medium term, the strength of the union as an actor uh, in terms of pulling together its member states, in terms of pulling together an economic package, in terms of pulling together a political uh, and epidemiological response to the crisis. Um, but all the time, and here again, I come back to, to, a, to a slight negative perhaps, it needs 
member state ownership and it needs to be driven by key member state. Without that Franco-German motor, we really would be in a much, in a much uh, worse situation. Um, and so if I was to finish and summarize on sort of the more geopolitical note, um, I think what, what, the, what, what the crisis has shown us is, is an acceleration in existing dynamics, an acceleration in our understanding of US decline as a global actor, um, highlighting China's profound weaknesses as a global actor, highlighting, I think, also Russia's irrelevance uh, as a global actor. Um, and what this crisis has done is, is shine a light on both the profound weaknesses of the European Union as an actor, but also signals towards its potential strength um, into, the, into the medium term and future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Uh, uh, can we now move on to Helene's? Helene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Federica, and uh, thank you from me as well to Nortria and Heidi Maurer for organizing this uh, very interesting series of seminars, um, very timely seminars. So um, I think uh, to start with, I, I would uh, like to uh, go in the same direction as Ben actually and say that this crisis most importantly demonstrates and perhaps reinforces the challenges that the European Union was already facing before the crisis with regard to um, the, um, uh, the weakening of the multilateral, liberal multilateral global order and uh, the weakening of international law and global institutions that uh, you mentioned uh, uh, in your introduction, Federica. And this of course has to do with the nature of the EU as a polity. The EU is not a state, it's a union of states. It doesn't have the kind of uh, foreign policy instrument that uh, states has, in particular uh, the uh, military instruments. And uh, it cannot so easily fall back on this idea of a national interest that it will uh, sort of promote effectively at the global level. So uh, the European Union really is at more of a disadvantage in the present context than, uh, than, uh, than states are. And we saw this also in particular in the beginning of the crisis. And I think we should remember also that the, the EU's foreign policy really gained momentum uh, at the end of the uh, Second Cold War, uh, when the multilateral order was really uh, consolidated globally. So it's almost as if it's difficult to disentangle the strengthening of a global multilateral order and the development uh, and uh, emergence of the European Union as a global actor. So in this sense, I do think the weakening of multilateralism globally and also this crisis then as, as part of that um, illustrate the fundamental challenges that the European Union is facing and the fundamental choices that uh, have to be made in terms of what kind of role the European Union should play uh, globally. Um, in addition, I think what's, what this crisis has shown and perhaps strengthened this is the, the difference in uh, uh, or the potential differences when crisis strikes in the value basis of US foreign policy and EU foreign policy and the difficulties that this also makes for the European Union. After all, the United States has been the core ally for the US, for, for the EU. Uh, and uh, when this partner becomes uh, so unpredictable, this, this is an additional challenge for a polity such as uh, the European Union. So I think I'll stop here now and I'll come back uh, in the next round. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Helene. Kolya, can you please add your wise words? Thank you very much, uh, Federica. Thank you all for, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to, to have a discussion about the impact of COVID-19 on foreign policy of the European Union. Um, I think it was The Economist who said uh, in the second last edition that we are witnessing the end of globalization. 
and um, in other words, deglobalization, and um, indeed uh, uh, is kicking in, so to speak, uh, and and with it uh, the contestation of globalization, global governance, the international liberal order continues to take place, and potentially also the rise of uh, of geopolitical maneuvers um, of of states who are who are seeing um, a new way. Uh, perhaps turning, uh, you know, with a withdrawal from international cooperation and geopolitical rivalry, um, becoming more the rule rather than the exception, they, they rather turn to perhaps uh, measures of realpolitik. Um, that may be in fact the case. Uh, ben has mentioned China already. Um, and uh, we also saw very interestingly uh, the other day that Donald Trump um, is now inviting India to join the next um, uh, G7 uh, meeting, which is interesting uh, if you think about the geopolitical competition that the US has with China. Uh, India is here a very important uh, partner. Um, now, all of that being said, I think there is an ongoing contestation going on, a, con a twofold contestation that is now indeed accelerating um, uh, and uh, impacting on the EU on two ends. The one is coming from within. Uh, rising contestation uh, is not only one of other states, it's also one within European societies. And uh, with it increasingly, uh, so to speak, uh, as um, Peter de Vilde um, has mentioned in a co-edited volume, The Struggle Over Borders, uh, the rise, so to speak, of right-wing communitarian ideologies, at uh, the end, so to speak, of cosmopolitan values, uh, question mark, um, at least being contested uh, across European societies. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, we know there are still a lot of people within the European Union who actually believe in cosmopolitan uh, values and principles. Uh, why do I say this? Because this uh, e eventually may actually lead to a reshuffling of European foreign policy, depending on which direction um, the political, so to speak, the political Brussels takes. Um, you mentioned, Federica, already the von der Leyen Commission, the geopolitical uh, commission, uh, and also Josep Borrell uh, very much answering this in, 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 in a lot of his comments. Uh, we have to see whether this is basically a continuation of a more, let's say, a communitarian approach to European foreign policy, uh, or whether this is something else. Um, and I, I put this out there as a question mark because I think this is one of the big challenges that the European Union will face uh, in the next couple of years. The other one is coming, of course, uh, through the contestation by other states, um, the contestation of the international order, but also the European Union itself. Uh, changes in the power constellation, um, contestation of institutionalized statuses, such as the BRICS have continuously been doing, uh, demands of international reform, and even demands for in in institutional and international decline. And the US is here leading, so to speak, um, the, the, um, the alliance, if you like, of those who are no longer necessarily investing in multilateral cooperation, but rather pushing for institutional decline. All of that following, so to speak, the theory of globalization um, by Mer Michael Zern, who has basically said, well, it's not only about the contestation of societal forces, but also of other states. Why is that important for the EU? And I will be quick now um, to sum up. Well, because it hits the EU in three different ways. It may have difficulties approaching the world uh, continuously, as a cosmopolitan power, given the rise of communitarian ideology across European societies. Second, I think the multilateral system, uh, based on particular set of international principles, rules and procedures, um, is being questioned. And the EU is a mirror of this. Uh, you can also say it's a laboratory of this. So uh, if the EU is being questioned, um, then it will be very difficult for the EU to actually act in the multilateral context and in a an, in an, uh, multilateral international order. And last but not least, um, third, I think indeed 
the EU as a laboratory of global governance um, is being 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 basically challenged by statism and and nationalism. Um, so I would say yes, it's a unity of states, but the EU has always shown that it is also something more when it comes to external action. It's not only dependent on its member states, it also has driving forces such as the European Commission um, and the European Parliament uh, with regards to external action. Well, if we see that they are under threat, uh, sorry, if they, if they are under stress, uh, if actually such political institutions are no longer uh, investing in cosmopolitan values, no longer investing in what we knew the EU for, then we are seeing something completely new on the rise. I have prepared a couple of more points, but I will say that in the next round. Sorry for being long. No, thank you. I mean, that was a super interesting and uh, uh, the three of you have already given me plenty of uh, uh, ideas, so I cannot resist the temptation to push you a little bit further, in fact. Because, I mean, uh, if I can be provocative, but just for the fun of it, um, and to paraphrase what uh, uh, Helene uh, said, I mean, is it difficult to disentangle the EU from global governance or is it impossible? Because in a way, it seems to me that the sort of juxtaposition that you were suggesting, Kolya, between on the one hand cosmopolitan values and on the other hand community values, I mean, shouldn't automatically put the EU on the side of cosmopolitan values, end of the story, on the losing side of history, sorry, out. I mean, it seems to me that somehow, it's not just that I started as a European community, but it also seems to me that, the, that multilateralism, it's not necessarily tied to the global level. I mean, it can equally work on a number of levels. And it is true that obviously, uh, as experts of uh, EU foreign policy, we all place ourselves automatically at the global level. But maybe, I mean, there is a different story that can be told here about, you know, the geo part of geopolitics, that the return of uh, the importance of territory doesn't necessarily have to be the grave of the EU or even of globalization, as long as it is managed multilaterally. And so maybe we can have a second round where we can look a little bit closer at what value multilateralism can have in this uh, contested uh, context that we're uh, talking about. Um, as, as Ben very nicely put it, uh, in the short term, it, it has been all a sort of a national response to COVID-19. But then we can imagine a sort of a mid to long term where things evolve differently. I must admit that to me, the crisis that is most similar to the one that we are in at the moment uh, is the oil crisis of 1973. Uh, where there was, you know, a huge shock to the system. The first response was absolutely national. But then in the mid to long term, there was the possibility to develop cooperation um, alternatives and to actually develop multilateralism. Um, you need leaders to do it. Uh, but it does not seem to me that the current context is absolutely stuck against uh, multilateralism. But uh, over to you speakers, uh, shall we start with uh, um, Kolya now, and uh, then uh, uh, Helene and then Ben, yeah? Thank you very much, Federica. No, I think it's very important to talk about multilateralism and to think about uh, what um, can met multilateralism add? Um, can the EU save, so to speak, multilateralism? Uh, and, and to be perfectly honest, it seems that the EU is very much, still very much 
obviously interested in multilateralism, um, but it it has never been in exclusively interested in multilateralism, I would say, at the same time. Uh, whenever uh, it was time to rather go for bilateral Okay, now I'm back now. Okay, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so I think bilateralism has always been with the EU itself, uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the EU uh, uh, ultimately turns to geopolitics uh, influence over, over territories, if you want to use that definition for geopolitics. Um, uh, so I think that we have to be careful to say it's either multilateralism or bilateralism uh, or multilateralism. Um, at the, the EU has been, over the last weeks, um, looking for multilateral answers. Uh, it has been addressing the United Nations. It has been um, basically showing uh, that it is important to actually invest in the United Nations. It had created its own donor conference however you want to look at it, but it's a multilateral informal donor conference, if you like. Um, uh, it's, it's been uh, actually continuously, even in its bilateral relations, uh, for example, uh, in some of the strategic uh, cooperation agreements, such as the one with, uh, with, with Japan lately, um, very clear that even though bilateralism is very important also to answer uh, perhaps um, uh, China and also to, so to speak, anchor the connectivity strategy of the European Union with Japan. It has always been also pointing at multilateralism to actually invest together with partners in multilateralism. So I think that is very important. I think, to be perfectly honest with you, that when the Commission, when the, or the incoming Commission, and especially the Commission President, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, mentioned that she wanted a geopolitical um, commission. Uh, this was actually a way to say, I actually want to focus more on the European neighborhood. Um, and indeed, when we look at the multi-annual uh, budget, the MFF, we see that it's no longer global Europe, but it's European neighborhood and the world, right? So there is, a, there, is a, there is a change. But it does not necessarily mean potentially that the EU is now playing, so to speak, geopolitics like, as Helena said already, uh, that it is playing geopolitics with the same instruments uh, that a state, a Westphalian state, would have at its disposal. It comes more with what uh, Anna Junkos and, and also Sven Bishop uh, have called perhaps the, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the, a, re a more realistic assessment um, of, of, of the EU's neighborhood, especially, and perhaps the neighbors of the neighborhood. Um, something like realpolitik with European char characteristics. I think that's what, what Sven Bishop called it. So last point on this. Is there a trade-off, right? Is there a trade-off if you can't have multilateralism, if you can't push cosmopolitan values and, 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 and procedures? Well, I, I'm afraid there is. I'm afraid there is, especially in the European neighborhood. I think, I think uh, the European Union is ready to actually push very pragmatically more its interests rather than universal um, norms, uh, human rights, uh, for, for obviously being, being the most important in, the, in these categories, um, and rather pushing for its own interests. Um, at the same time, there's another question here. Is the EU perhaps more inward-looking, becoming more inward-looking? What does this COVID crisis make out of the EU as an actor? And then, very last point here. It's very interesting. If you look at the new revised budget, right, that is now on the table, um, that the, the budget lines on external action have not been gained, well, have not gained, right? Uh, they have all decreased. Uh, the defense budget is, is down. Um, the one on the European neighborhood in the world is also down. Not signi significantly, but there is no increase. 
there is no such thing as a geopolitical, let's say, push that COVID would have had on the budget calculations of the Commission. Okay, I'm again too long, sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. You're generous with your time. <laughs> Helene. Thanks, Federica. Um, I think I have four, uh, four points. Uh, I'm not sure if I managed completely to answer your question, but I'll, I'll try. Firstly, I think when we talk about multilateralism, we, we have to remind ourselves all the time that multilateralism is, is quite a vague notion. Uh, when I was speaking uh, in the first intervention, I was thinking of multilateralism mainly as a way of regulating relations between states. And in that sense, I think it's, uh, it brings then uh, certain obligations on all states, such as uh, 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 equal treatment, et cetera, et cetera, and, and committing to some common rules. So in that sense, I think we can, at least at an analytical level, distinguish that from geopolitics, which is, you know, uh, has connotations of great powers, uh, governing within their own spheres of interest and some kind of global order then emerging as a balance between these great powers and their different spheres of interest. So I'm not, uh, it's still not very clear to me what kind of geopoliti geopolitical um, Europe uh, the president of the commission was actually talking about. I, I, I'm, I'd be surprised if she was talking about the kind of geopolitics that we think about when we study international relations. So that was just a uh, first point. The second point, I don't think the, I don't think it's over. <laughs> you asked provocatively, you know, it's a bye-bye to cosmopolitan principles and all of that. And it's all now national interest and geopolitics. I think what this crisis has shown so clearly is precisely the acute tension between the absolute need for strong international institutions, supranationalism, not only in the European Union, but beyond uh, the European Union. Uh, and, and this, I mean, this need that you would see uh, through reason is colliding with the emotions of politics uh, so it's rather a tension that I don't think uh, has been resolved and I don't think we can conclude that it's uh, over for uh, multilateralism and geopolitics has completely taken over. Um, especially if you think in the, in the longer term and also if you observe what's going on within the European Union at the moment, I think the institutions are now sort of a... Uh, um, doing a lot to reinforce um, uh, EU cohesion. So that's the second point. The third point is that regardless of this tension between um, multilateralism on the one hand and geopolitical uh, uh, international affairs on the other hand, uh, I think you, they will always at the global level, we can all, I think we can regardless of that and regardless of which side sort of takes over, there will be what you referred to as local or regional multilateralisms. Uh, I would perhaps uh, think that we could also observe what I would call more issue-specific issue multilateralisms. I mean, there are lots of more low-key issues uh, that can be dealt with at the global level within multilateral regimes and that will probably go under the radar of all this sort of my nation first uh, arguments and I think we also observe at the moment that the European Union is doing a lot at that level in terms of reinforcing that kind of multilateral cooperation globally I would say that this is a kind of segmented multilateralism. It operates with issue-specific concerns and with its own kinds of uh, uh, with its own kind of issue-specific logic. So um, that still leaves open the concern for the overarching rules of the game, if you like, that I think cannot be solved uh, with this kind of segmented multilateralism, but that I imagine will persist regardless of 
of what takes over as a kind of overarching uh, uh, tendency of regulating relations. Uh, fourth point, uh, what's, what value can be rescued for the European, for, for multilateralism and can the European Union save it? I mean, obviously the European Union cannot save multilateralism on its own. It needs partners to do that. Um, it seems to me that the European Union has three options with regard to a multilateral order. Uh, the first one would be to adapt um, in the sense that it could pull out of its own multilateral approach those aspects that are considered intrusive to the domestic affairs of other states. So you would have more of a classic kind of multilateralism with an emphasis on sovereignty and non-intervention, but that would still be a rules-based uh, global order that the European Union could uh, push for. Second option for the European Union would be to readjust and refine what is perhaps the core of the European uh, Union's approach as we think about it, with, and that would be more in line with the cosmopolitan perspective that Kolya is talking about. Uh, that would require um, a stronger focus on consistency in terms of the EU's uh, foreign policies and a stronger emphasis on international law that also carries rights for people and not only for states. So that would be a second option, probably much more difficult and much more risky because you might uh, meet retaliation from great powers who do not like that you talk about human rights, for example. Or lastly, uh, a third strategy that the European Union could adopt would be uh, uh, learning to see if there's something in the responses to its own approach, to its own cosmopolitan approach, uh, that it's worth taking into account. Uh, there's a lot of research pointing to this, uh, this argument that the European Union considers one size to fit everyone, that the European Union um, talks to rather than with other countries. So a kind of a, um, as if the European Union in a sense acts like a self-appointed arbiter with regard to what would be the correct universal rules that everyone should abide to. So. Uh, a learning option would be to reconsider perhaps some of these um, parts of its own external policies and its own approach to multilateralism and incorporate them without necessarily abandoning uh, the core concerns for the autonomy of the individual, for example, and for uh, some kind of rules-based order. So, I think all of those strategies uh, are costly in different ways, um, but uh, yes, three options for the European Union if it wants to attempt together with partners to do some kind of rescue of multilateralism globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helene. Ben, would you like to add uh, your voice? <laughs> Thanks, Federica, and, and and thank you very much for the for the provocation. I think I think we'll all look back to the to the 1990s as sort of the the, the missed opportunity. Um, that was a very unique moment in which the European Union really was the poster child for what we thought was going to be a new kind of global politics. Um, it was a point in our history where the, the 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 DNA of the European Union mapped perfectly onto the global genome. Um, that we that we thought was uh, that we thought was developing before us. What we now have is this new invasive cancer of of nationalism, of ethno nationalism, uh, and and how does the European Union respond to that? I think my concern is that the European Union has choices before it, as as Helena has said, but I'm very very uncomfortable with this bifurcation between values and interests um, because for me. That is not a that is not a that is not a, a dialectic. Um, the interests of the European Union are material, but the interests of the European Union are also ideational. Uh, and without that normative foundation, without those normative values, uh, 
the European Union is simply not the European Union. Uh, and my very real concern with a very loose talk of geopolitics and European armies and, and the European Union be getting, getting more realistic about how it approaches the world. Uh, my fear is that, 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 that we, we dive down a Westphalian rabbit hole um, that the European Union simply cannot survive in. It is not ever going to be an effective geopolitical actor. We have got to use and work with the tools and mechanisms at our disposal. Now, that's not to say that the European Union is, in some sense, an ideal actor. Uh, I mean, if we talk to our colleagues in, in development economics, talk to our colleagues in trade, you know, there is no global actor more red in tooth and claw than the European Union in terms of defending its material interests. Um, and the UK government is getting a lesson in that as we speak in terms of Brexit, what power means when the union decides to employ it. All I'm saying is that the union needs to marshal and build on its strengths rather than try and fill in holes in weaknesses which are bottomless pits that the European Union can never fill in terms, for example, like in the, in the area of military security and defense. So to my mind, where I pick up then from, from Helena is, is in terms of, of strategy going forward, the union has got to reach out in a much more active and assertive way than it has in the past to build either thematic coalitions uh, based on interest, uh, material interest, or more profound partnership coalitions that are built on shared ideational interest. However, and this is, I'll end on this point, my, 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 my other qualification is that the European Union has got to be mindful of its history. And if we are going to reach out to other global actors, particularly in the global south, we have got to be acutely mindful of the fact that we created the Westphalian dragon. We imposed the Westphalian model on much of the rest of the world with very poor effect. So that in terms of reaching out to new global actors and creating the kinds of new coalitions that Helena is talking about, we have to be mindful of that history, have to be respectful of those partners, and have to go to the nth degree in listening before we propose. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, no, definitely. That's a very all valid points. Um, I am now moving on to the Q and A. Uh, first on my list is uh, Sally Isaac from uh, Cairo, and then there will be Robert Kisak and Catherine uh, Jegou. Uh, Sally, would you like uh, to uh, ask your question? Yes, thank you very much, Federica. I have uh, two questions for the speakers. Um, kind of not really questions, but I would like to hear their comments on two things. The first one, is um, that the crisis in the European Union would lead to uh, diminishing its engagement in external action, as was noted by the speakers, especially in the neighborhood. So um, do they think that this could be capitalized on by other powers such as Russia and China, especially in uh, key crises in the Mediterranean uh, that we all know of? The second uh, question is, um, do you think that in terms of economic recovery, the effects of the coronavirus crisis would have a heavier effect on Europe compared to China? Uh, also noting the type of monetary and fiscal policies adopted so far by and within the EU and China. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Very good questions. Robert, would you like to add your words? Thank you very much, Federica. Hello, everyone. Hello to the panelists. Uh, this is just a quick point to Ben. I'd just like to push back a little bit and hear your reflection on the very last inter part of your intervention, which was the idea that the 1990s was a unique moment in history when the European Union's DNA mapped onto the genome of global uh, governance. If you look at to the work by Blanko Milanovic and all of the people who are working very much on global inequalities, that really was a time when the world from the European Union perspective may have seen it seen to reflect the, the sort of vision that you pointed, but it was a period of great, great and gross inequality. And while we are certainly on one hand looking at the present situation and the global politics that's, or the geopolitics that are emerging as 
part of the Westphalian sort of reemergence of national interest. I would also say that it's a consequence of a rather profound leveling of the global economic activity and with it the power which that um, is, is allowing new states to, to push back on. So is it really the case that the 1990s was that great for everyone from a global perspective? Excellent point. Thank you, Robert. Catherine. Thank you very much, uh, Federica, and thank you very much to the speakers and for the organization of this uh, conference. I have two questions. One is about the internal reaction of the EU and the other on the external reaction. In terms of internal reaction, uh, we have Article 222 of the treaty, which says that EU states have to provide assistance to other EU states which are victim of natural or man-made disasters. And the speakers were actually showing that today the EU has reacted for the health crisis and for the economics crisis. So if we can all agree it was abysmal at first, but now it's relatively good. So, but with this relatively good, is there anything else the speakers think the EU should be doing today for the health of the, for the economics crisis? Is there anything missing from what the EU is actually doing today internally? Now externally, uh, the elephant in the room for me used to be the US. Today the US is non-existent and so the new elephant is China. Well, it's always been there, but it's rising and the EU doesn't know what to do with it. So Ben, you were talking about material and ethics, but this has been going on for years since Tiananmen with China. So what do we do with that elephant? What do we do with those ethics and uh, those strategies? And that's for all of the speakers with China. Thank you, Catherine. Calypso, can you add your words, please? Calypso? Yes, sorry. <laughs> I thought okay. I would be in the next round, so I hadn't unmuted. Thank you, Federica, and for a great discussion. And I just wanted to bounce off on uh, this big question of can the EU save multilateralism? Perhaps to encourage us to, I mean, I, I, I loved what everybody had to say, and there was a lot of healthy skepticism, and yet we still use the word save. So perhaps I, the question is, you know, should we not, you know, drop this idea, and Ellen was very forceful on that self-appointed guardian of multilateralism, and then and, and literally turn things around, you know. So it clearly in, you, in, the, in the presentation, there are three ways in which the EU enters the debate on multilateralism. You know, the first is as a laboratory or as a model, if you take it to the extreme. And every time we can ask, you know, how can we use COVID-19 as a moment where we're more effective? So Ben was talking about uh, the bad communicator. So here, you know, if we are the model, good or bad, or at least the lab, um, how do we speak to the world about our failure? Um, the, the obvious failures at the beginning or what we got right. And specifically, you know, how we are entering a moment where we reframe you know, the value of interdependence, uh, simply because everyone can see that <laughs> interdependence has been problematic. So maybe sometimes autonomy is better at various levels, starting with your neighborhood, but maybe not. And, and so we are having this internal debate. In this sense, we are a microcosmos for better or worse. So that's the first one. But then that's the model, who we are and how it inspires multilateralism. But the second that is very much the theme of today is as an external actor. And Kolya was talking about um, geopolitical means neighborhood. And, and indeed, that because this is existential, that's when you're geopolitical. Um, and, and Ellen was talking about sphere of influence. When are we going to uh, acknowledge that instead of accusing others to play the sphere of influence game, that this is the game that the EU has long been playing and it's a game it continues to play. And the question is, uh, because we, we're trying to <laughs> control, stabilize, whatever, our neighborhoods, not always in the best way and sometimes by externalizing our own problems. So then the question becomes, well, you know, how do we spell consistency in our external action in the way we treat others at our borders, individuals as well as countries, um, and indeed acknowledge the fact that there is a real contradiction because 
we treat the neighborhood in variations of unilateralism, um, which is more or less what Ellen was saying. Um, how are we going to revisit this you know, at a time when COVID spells the fact that really this can't work? But also, if we take the third way in which we plug into multilateralism, again, you discussed it a lot, as a member of the system, not through external action, but how we participate, suggest, build, et cetera. And there, I think that um, the, the way in which um, we will, A, be able to multilateral, to, to, to uh, ask how our external actions can be multilateralized, how we can leverage our um, discourse on reform. For instance, WTO reform, where uh, these days we're talking about a global health and trade initiative. Um, all of these, how do we do this? You know, back to the point that was just made on distributive justice, in a way, again, that is consistent and self-reflective on how it relates to the other two. So I guess my question in kind of putting forward this like three-way separation is how do we create a greater cons consistency between those three levels or is it not necessary? These are different realms with different logics of action. Um, and, and I guess also to encourage all of us and the speakers to come back to the way, the extent to which COVID you know, reframes this kind of eternal, you know, long-held problem. Thank you very much. Um, shall I, may I suggest that the speakers uh, have a go at this very uh, good list of questions before we go for a second round? I can see Tomasz uh, uh, on the list, but if Tomasz, you can wait for a second, we can give the floor to the speakers and then uh, maybe other people would like to come in as well. Um, which order should we go uh, for now? I'm, uh, I'm losing uh, the, the order of the speakers, but maybe we can have uh, uh, Helene start uh, and then uh, Ben and then Kolya. Okay, thanks. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, all these very important interventions. I'm not gonna pretend to be able to answer even half of them. Um, I just it just uh, struck me that um, so on, I'll pick up on one thing. I think it's a combination of uh, what Robert and, and Calypso uh, raised. Um, I think what what I've been thinking a lot about during the Globus project is this idea that the uh, we as scholars as well as the European Union as a kind of political uh, entity. Uh, for long assumed, as Ben also said, that, that um, uh, the multilateral order, the way it was understood by the European Union, uh, had uh, legitimacy. We took that almost for granted when we entered into the debate on normative power Europe, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, the European Union, I think, also in its foreign policy, has assumed that its version of multilateralism uh, had a strong legitimacy globally and what we uh, observe now is that this has to be reconsidered it has to be reconsidered by the european union so where is the european union to go now and i think also we in our scholarship have to take this even more seriously uh, than what we have done so far. And of course, the work of Calypso has been very important in, in, that, uh, in that regard. So what can we do? <laughs> that's a, it's a difficult to, to it's a, it's, that's the $1 million question in a sense. Um, my hunch is to think more about the third of the three strategies that I uh, mentioned in the previous intervention, which has to do with normative learning. So it's this requirement of um, acknowledging that uh, recognition can actually pay off in foreign policy, recognizing uh, the other as different and uh, listening and making sure that we have uh, institutional structures and uh, procedures that make it possible 
uh, for those different voices to be heard and then also uh, establishing perhaps institutionalizing uh, learning processes within the EU foreign policy system that makes it possible to perhaps uh, adjust uh, foreign policy also with reference to that external input. So that's very easy for me to say as a scholar who is sitting here at my desk, much more difficult for the politicians to actually put such a thing into practice. But uh, my hunch is this is where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. Ben, what do you think? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to extrapolate exactly from where Helena left off. Um, but I go even that little bit further. I'd say multilateralism doesn't have to be reconsidered. Multilateralism now has to be earned. You know, we wasted the opportunity um, that I described earlier that I think uh, uh, Robert correctly corrected me on. You know, our DNA mapped onto the existing genome very perfectly, but it was our own hubris and our own lack of self-criticalness and self-reflectivity that allowed us to preside over multilateralism that did not serve everybody's interests, either ideational or material, and gave rise to those inequalities, both at home as well as overseas. So if we are to reconstruct or reconstitute some semblance of a multilateral order or lots of mini multilateral orders, we're going to have to really make, make that earned and we're gonna to have to work for it. Um, and that's where I think Calypso's points come into, come into play here in terms of critical self-reflection and the points that I made earlier about, about, about understanding where we're coming from in terms of European history, in terms of reaching out to global actors to show that multilateralism can deliver in a way that multilateralism hasn't delivered in the past. My final point though, sorry, second last point is, 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 is a more worrisome one. If you look, as, as somebody um, raised in the, in, the, in the chat function here, if you look at the issue of migration, for example, and the deal with Libya, you know, there, there are clearly very two distinct paths there. One is to, is to reflect the worst instincts of Europe in terms of ethno-nationalism, in terms of protection, in terms of exclusion, in terms of hypocrisy. That could play very positively in political terms domestically in Europe, a fortress Europe kind of scenario. The kind of Europe I personally would prefer in the opposite direction, the more cosmopolitan direction, that, has, that battle has not to be won with our external partners. That battle has to be won domestically. Mm -hmm. And tragically, Europe now faces genuine contestation over its soul domestically. And that's the political battle that I foresee as being, as being even the more dangerous than the external machinations of how we deal in a disordered world. My final final point, though, is just in respect of, of Catherine's point on, on, um, on, on elephants in rooms, etc. Um, and, and I think this is a point that is becoming more, more, uh, more germane, and that is the extent to which China is losing uh, in, terms of, in terms of offering an alternative pole of attraction. Um, and, and so much of what we've seen in terms of China's response to the virus and in terms of China's dealing with, with, the, with, the, with the pandemic going forward is something that I think is, is turning off not just domestic audiences within, within, within Europe, but it is turning off domestic audiences globally. So I think of all the actors, I think China is coming out worse from this crisis. Thank you, Ben. Kolya. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very interesting comments. And I think uh, what is perhaps very important to, to be mentioned is, from my perspective at least, that uh, essentially it's about the big question, how can we cooperate when we are contested? How can we cooperate with the contesters? And, uh, and, and this is for me both internally but also externally one of the, the big questions, uh, both in terms of multilateralism uh, but also uh, in, in terms of how the European Union is reacting to the crisis internally. Um, and I think uh, to follow up on what Ben has said, uh, multilateralism has to be earned um, perhaps uh, in another way or an additional way of thinking about it is to think about, well, how can we actually uh, come to new terms to actually think about multilateralism as uh, 
a form of cooperation uh, which is indeed about mutual gains, which is not uh, basically a structure which you impose upon others and then in the end the Western world wins um, or in the future perhaps another part of the world, but that actually um, we are trying to establish procedures by which we can make very clear we are actually interested in mutual gains, both regionally but also globally. We are actually, uh, so to speak, looking after uh, what you may call external output legitimacy, right? So you are not only looking into what is in for me, uh, what comes out of that system for me, out of that process for me, but what is also in for others. And based on that idea, to actually think about how we can bring people to the table. And it may actually not be multilateralism always um, uh, in, 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 in its most global fashion. It may actually be smaller pockets uh, of multilateralism. And the European Union, I think, um, given its DNA that I believe is still there, uh, the multilateral DNA, is uh, probably uh, having an answer for this. It doesn't, it doesn't rule out um, uh, differentiated integration either, right? Uh, so uh, that is of course a discussion that other uh, colleagues of us are leading with regards to other fields, but of course we have been touching on that uh, as well in terms of European foreign policy when it comes, for example, um, to um, the uh, PASCO initiative, for example, which after all didn't actually um, play out as a differentiated integration. So what I try to say is, I guess, that we have to show that there is something to be gained um, from multilateralism and that the EU should actually convince others to also um, invest in that multilateral gain. And I think to a certain extent, um, just to, to briefly come to that, uh, it will always be important that the United States are on board. I, I think for the, for, for the European Union, I wouldn't say that the US is, is, is no longer there. I, I would also not say that the only elephant, so to speak, in the room is China. I think we are having uh, two uh, very uh, strong elephants currently, and it's very important for the EU to also make sure that we are finding ways to persuade the US to return to the multilateral table. Thank you, Kolya. I can see two more blue hands. I can also see two comments in the chat, and I wonder whether Pierre-Luc Dupont and Jérôme Legrand might turn those comments into uh, questions. Um, but let's first go to Tomasz. Thank you very much for being patient. Tomasz? Thank you very much, and thanks a lot to everybody for, for excellent debate. Uh, I, I was just attracted to, to ask a question by Ben's uh, comment on the bottomless pits uh, in terms of European security and defense. Uh, and I, while I do agree with you that this particular pit seems to be very bottomless, uh, I wonder if we talk about geopolitical union, uh, we, don't, we do not only talk about the great powers. Uh, we also talk about the neighborhood, especially both east and south. And it might be that, you know, having great development uh, cooperation power and having great trade powers is not enough. It's not just the only demand from some of these countries. So I wonder to what extent the EU can actually uh, get out of it that easily just to claim, you know, this is bottomless pit. Just let's resign on that. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And then we have Antonio Zotti. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the contributors. Um, the question I wanted, the issue I wanted to raise is something that we have already talked about with Helen and, and Ben, uh, since I also participated in the Globus project. Um, and the fact is that um, let's, uh, let, let's say that mutual recognition is the way to go. Um, if that is the case, uh, what I see here is the need to sort of bridge between over the 
uh, domestic uh, and international divides, as, as uh, Ben aptly uh, pointed out, we have an, an internal other. Uh, the European Union is, uh, is facing an internal other. Uh, a process of internal othering, that is the Euroscepticism that is organizing itself, that is um, sort of becoming a force to be uh, reckoned with. And so uh, every time uh, that uh, we, we take the mutual recognition uh, as sort of the rationality of uh, the way we organize uh, as Europeans uh, relations with others outside, uh, we cannot gloss over the fact that that sort of recognition of the others outside has a very strong impact, especially as far as uh, problems as migration are, are concerned. And what makes this sort of application of mutual recognition both in the domestic sphere and in the international sphere difficult uh, to actually apply is the fact that as long as we live in a, pub, in, in, in a moment where the public discourse is dominated by uh, an emergency rationality, where we have to face important things first, we are bound to see things as happened as those that happened in Greece, uh, where the problem of uh, um, keeping uh, potentially dangerous people outside could be justified in terms of public health. So we are facing an internal emergency, so we cannot afford to let people from outside in. Uh, we couldn't do that when we had no COVID crisis going on, certainly we cannot do it right now. And I think this raises a very uh, difficult uh, uh, problem, is the fact that in order to apply mutual recognition, we need institutional change. But institutional change is sort of off the table as long as we are facing an emergency. So this is sort of a catch-22 situation. Uh, we have to deal with the instruments that we have. We, we can only apply the instruments we have, but as long as we have these instruments, mutual recognition is going to be very hard to apply. Is there any way to come out of this catch-22 situation? Thank you very much, Antonio, Pierre-Luc, Dupont. Um, hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Thank you for um, organizing this uh, really uh, interesting uh, webinar. So <clears throat> my, my, my question, just to return on this point, um, sort of um, the EU's cosmopolitan principles having been undermined by the rise of nationalism and statism. Um, I was wondering how, how the uh, panel, how the speakers um, would assess, uh, I, I would think one of one important indicator of cosmopolitan sort of values or engagement would be um, sort of support for global human rights uh, institutions, for instance. Um, so, how how do you evaluate um, the EU's activity in that uh, in that area over the last decade, for instance? Um, have you seen a sort of a trend towards uh, more engagement, less engagement, or has it has it been you know um, more or less constant? Um, so, yeah, just. Um, yeah, I guess that would be my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre Luc. Uh, speakers, uh, um, plenty of uh, points more to uh, address. Uh, who would like uh, to go first? Uh, ben, would you like uh, to give it a, a go? Sure, thank you very much. Um, I mean, Tomas, I, I take your point absolutely. Um, I suppose I, I find myself in the bizarre situation that. In an Irish context, I'm seen as an advocate of militarism, and in the European context, I'm seen as some kind of weirdo pacifist. Um, I'd like to square the circle by suggesting that what the European Union needs to be doing is, is, is to build on strengths rather than fill holes on weakness. Now, I do agree that there are certain aspects, particularly in terms of pooling and sharing, in coordinating and integrating European militaries, there, there are huge advantages that can be achieved, with relatively modest amounts of res with relatively modest resources. My concern is 
that the political narrative surrounding defense and security in Europe is so pervaded by this Westphalian imagery of strategic autonomy and defense, up to and including, you know, French suggestions for, for lending the force de frappe as a strategic nuclear defense of the European Union and, and loose talk and conversation about European army, that it just gets us off on the wrong foot and leads us down a path where there's very little positive benefit to be accrued to European foreign policy more generally. So what I'm an advocate for is, is perhaps a more surgical, a more precise, um, and perhaps a more modest uh, conversation about how you integrate military capabilities to give the European Union the kinds of resources it needs to sustain and support a broader foreign policy agenda. Um, in, in response to, to, to Antonio very, very quickly, um, there's, a, there's a phrase in the English language that you should never, you should never waste a good crisis. Um, and, and there's certainly, I think, a sense that in terms of responding to, to this crisis in terms of COVID, there, there is an opportunity there, um, were it to be taken up by policy, policy leaders and policy practitioners, there is an opportunity there to rethink our approach to global politics. We're seeing that, I think, in response to the European Union's relations with China. I think we are seeing a very profound rethink of what the nature of that relationship is, what the nature of China is as a potential partner, its limitations and particularly its weaknesses. Um, so I think the crisis does give rise to opportunities, um, which of policy leaders are, are, are attuned enough and are ambitious enough can be taken advantage of. Thank you. Kolya. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps very briefly on what Tomas has said um, uh, and, and asked uh, a, in, in the field of security and defense, I think it's uh, very important to also see and sense a little bit how currently the debate is being, so to speak, um, uh, framed in the, in the context of the uh, European Commission. Uh, we are back to using vocabulary like coherence uh, in the European uh, Commission when it comes to security and defense, which was, which is very interesting uh, because it, it, it's been a debate that, that has been ongoing and we've been coming from comprehensive approaches uh, to integrative approaches and now we are back to, to coherence and indeed, as Ben has said, that, that may hint at uh, something like an integration of security and defense into a wider spectrum of instruments that are already and obviously also much more, um, uh, so to speak, uh, underpinned with financial sources at the hand of, of the European uh, uh, at the European Union. So I think that is interesting as an observation. I would would say, well, that's probably the way how how it would have been developing. But after COVID, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm I'm also not so sure with that new um, so to speak budget plan that is currently on the table. How much that commission that new commission is actually uh, pushing for, let's say, the uh, Juncker initiative. Um, uh, anymore, and um, I'm, I, it would be, you know, from a research angle, highly interesting to look into discontinuities between the two commissions here. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps one thing on on uh, mutual recognition, um, I, I think one observation again on on the whole debate, and we're coming back to something that we've been saying to bo before: how sure can we be that the European Union? will be the same European Union as an actor when it comes out of this crisis, when it goes into deep economic crisis. How sure can we be that this is still a priority of the European Union? Perhaps we're finally seeing something. I'm just, you know, we, we may model this, I'm not sure. Uh, but perhaps we, we may actually see something much more um, that is familiar to the US system, right? Uh, a system that is, uh, very much more inward looking at times, depending on the political leadership that may call itself a geopolitical, but has a perhaps much less ambitions given the current crisis and the current um, state um, of the union. Also, very importantly, I think currently uh, it is very important from, from an outside perspective, obviously, to frame this as a global crisis. But who is actually seeing this 
as a global crisis and takes approaches in that direction. I have the feeling um, that indeed the European Union is trying to, to, to bring the house together, but um, I, it seems rather disproportionately weak on actually trying to get the global house in order. Helene. Um, with regard to the security and defense issue, I, I think I, I agree with Ben that, that um, uh, you know, the EU cannot be a, a military power compared in comparison with the US or China or, uh, or Russia. So, uh, so uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a pity if the European Union presents a discourse that, that uh, uh, implies that this might might be an ambition uh, but uh, it seems to me also that the most important uh, issue with regard to uh, to security and defense is is the issue of uh, how you uh, how you use your military power or any kind of power um, so uh, the key question, I think, uh, and I think this is also what Ben pointed at, is how the exercise of power uh, and the exercise of power instrument uh, is actually controlled and regulated. So uh, law is important even if you enter into um, power political instruments. Uh, they need to be regulated, their use need to be regulated through law. Uh, to Antonia, with regard to this uh, patch 22, I'm, I think perhaps it's uh, less uh, it's less strong than what you suggest, and that there, in a situation of crisis, there are possibilities for thinking differently or finding different kinds of solutions. But at the same time, it's clear that this uh, this idea of um, of a mutual recognition and of uh, uh, emphasizing difference and ensuring that all actors get a due hearing, uh, it has certain costs and risks as well. One risk is inefficiency. If you keep listening and listening and listening, then in the end uh, you cannot make decisions. So uh, there's a need to be able to draw the line also in uh, even if you are emphasizing the possibility of everyone uh, getting a due hearing. There's also a risk that you can be manipulated by other parties that they will use your effort to do hearing uh, to, uh, to, to use arguments that um, that just make it impossible to get to any kind of agreement. Uh, this kind of approach is also time, so it's time consuming, but it also requires a lot of resources, and I think a lot more resources than what the European Union and the External Action Service actually has available at the moment, because if you are to listen and understand the message that comes back to you, then you also need a lot, a lot of specialized knowledge, a lot of competence on what happens in other parts of the world. So the European Union would no doubt need to have a larger external action service in order to engage in this kind of uh, foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everybody for a fantastic set of uh, questions and raising many, many crucial uh, points and adding the, to the uh, discussion today. Uh, at this point, I think I will um, suggest that uh, you stay tuned on the, this sort of naughty challenge uh, that we're keeping <laughs> Uh, in the form of webinars uh, discussing European foreign policy in various contexts. Uh, and the next appointment is actually for next week, where I will be presenting about European foreign policy towards uh, the Mediterranean, and there will be uh, a bit more about geopolitics there. Uh, the following uh, week on, uh, uh, will be uh, a discussion about 50 years uh, of uh, EU foreign policy uh, which classics to read uh, 
uh, called the offer, Richard Whitman, who will introduce the discussion, but everybody will be welcome to uh, contribute. And after that, we have a session, a more of a professional session uh, about getting uh, um, how to organize your PhD and think about publishing. And again, we have a great panel of speakers, but we hope to see uh, many of you again uh, online uh, for a thorough discussion of all the uh, issues. Uh, in the meantime, uh, join me in a sort of a virtual uh, clap for our uh, speakers. Uh, maybe you can put the video on at this point. Um, and uh, um, I hope that uh, we can see you in all the possible corners uh, of the world. It's always good to know that uh, uh, the uh, discussion has been useful, uh, not just for me, but for everybody uh, online. And uh, thanks again to Ben, uh, Helene and Kolya for addressing all the issues uh, head on.